uh, is held in place in the central region, the very hot plasma is held in place by gravity. Uh, it, on Earth, we're trying to do that in things like the uh, ITER, International Totomac Experimental Reactor, that uh, many countries are coming together to build in France, using magnetic fields. When the charged particles try to get out, the magnetic fields bend them back into the middle, and the real problem is to keep them from scraping the sides of the bottle. But what we've now shown, because we're studying something very similar to what they're attempting to do, 15 million degrees in the middle of the sun, and we're able to see very accurately, within 10% or so, how many neutrinos are produced. It verifies the physics of what's happening in the middle and turns the problem into an engineering problem, which they're working very hard on. And as I said, it, it, it changed the laws of physics at a fundamental level. We have to go back to the, to the drawing boards in terms of understanding the basis of the standard model. Uh, we proved that neutrinos are not the dark matter particles that uh, uh, we, th we know exist because of their gravitational effects. And so we, and the reason is the neutrinos do, we do not know what, what the total mass is, but we know a limit on it, such that it's not heavy enough to be the dark matter particles. And it also led to the establishment of, uh, of the, this larger laboratory, Snow Lab, where we are doing uh, uh, significant other measurements to try to address this question of what is dark matter. These days, it is thought that uh, the universe is made up of uh, about 4% us, 4% the type of matter that you're familiar with uh, and, and work with every day your chairs and tables and everything else, and us. 26% is dark matter, about five times as much, and 70% is what's referred to as dark energy. It's a change in Einstein's laws of gravity. You're learning that gravity is always an attractive force between two objects that have mass. It turns out there's a very small repulsive force, such that if you study things that have been thrown out by the Big Bang that are a very large distance away, you find they've actually been repulsed a little bit over the billions of years that they've been, they've been moving. This is something that Einstein referred to as his biggest mistake. It turned out to be something that works in his formulas if you put it back in. And one of the explanations of it is that there's an energy in the universe which makes up about 70% of the total energy that explains this. And so in fact it was a triumph once again, for Einstein. <clears throat> so we're attempting to look for the dark matter particles that were produced in the Big Bang and that are affecting our galaxy at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, Geneva. Uh, they're attempting to make them for the first time since the Big Bang. The, the idea is maybe there's never been enough energy on Earth to create the mass that makes up these particles. So uh, let's talk about the Big Bang. <laughs> Not this Big Bang, we'll talk about this one in a minute, but uh, talking about this Big Bang, uh, I got to go and be Geek of the Week at uh, a filming of the Big Bang Theory in, uh, in, uh, in Burbank. Um, the uh, fellow who's the technical advisor to the Big Bang was actually a student of mine at Princeton when I was a professor there in the 1980s, David Salzberg. And I don't know if you watched the show, you may have noticed the formulas that are on the, on the uh, blackboards behind the, uh, the various things they're doing. Those are right. <laughs> the physics associated with, uh, with what they're doing is, uh, uh, is properly described there, and he keeps them current and, and, and puts forward uh, different ideas. So I got a chance to meet uh, the, uh, the stars of the, uh, uh, of the show and uh, sit in along with the writers and you may be interested that they, they have a live studio audience, they have all the writers there, the executive producer uh, is there as well. And if they don't get a laugh the first time they film a scene, then they go back to the writers, rewrite it on the spot, and try it again until they get something that the audience <laughs> responds to positively. So it's a real dynamic activity. So anyway, they. Uh, David uh, convinced the writers that it might be good if every now and again he brought in a real-life uh, geek uh, to, uh, for them to interact with. So, let's talk about the real Big Bang Theory. 
We think these days that there's very strong evidence that about 13 and a half billion years ago, there was an enormous uh, explosion in which everything in our universe was in a very tiny spot and, and exploded from there. In fact, we think there was a very rapid expansion called inflation in the early uh, universe, but even uh, 10 to the 32 seconds after that initial explosion, we're still at a temperature of 10 to the 27 degrees Celsius. It's an enormous amount of energy in a very confined spot. At that point, energy had been converted into matter and antimatter, equal amounts about matter and antimatter. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with what are called positrons, which are antimatter to electrons. In fact, all the particles we know have an antiparticle. Positron emission tomography is, uh, is in fact used very effectively because if you put a radioactive material in people's bloodstream and, and the positrons find electrons in the person's body, gamma rays are produced. Equal numbers of gamma rays that are back to back because you have to conserve momentum in, uh, in this process and the positrons and electrons that are annihilating into pure energy, two gamma rays, are at rest. So these back-to-back -back gamma rays connect between detectors on either side of your body and they can draw the lines that tell you where this uh, radioactive material has, uh, has, has gone, where the positrons are occurring. Well, back then, energy, we went in the other direction. Energy is converted into matter and antimatter particles. And we think there were equal amounts. One of the big questions that we're studying in a different experiment underground is, what the origin of the process is that ended up right now with a matter-dominated universe. Somehow all of the antimatter has decayed away. And that's a big puzzle that we don't understand yet. But we understand a lot of other things. We know that after a bit, the Clark quarks came together and formed protons and neutrons. After about three minutes, uh, we have a situation where it's become transparent. The light can get out. And people have studied that light, and that is what leads to a lot of this detailed theory. Uh, back uh, after about 300,000 years, you form atoms. The electrons find the, uh, the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And now, 13 billion years, 13 and a half billion years, this says 15, but uh, it's been updated since then, we have the universe that we, uh, that we inhabit and understand. And, uh, it turns out that dark matter particles have a big influence on the way in which this structure forms in the later universe. And so trying to understand them is a very important part of our science objectives in terms of understanding our universe. It turns out that if you look at a, uni at a, at a galaxy like ours, uh, it's kind of the shape of a cinnamon roll, the stars in the outer region are going so fast that there must be about five times as much matter not glowing as there is that glows. And that's what we're trying to observe. The, we call them weakly interacting massive particles. It's just a description of them. Weakly interacting like neutrinos, but much more massive. But it makes a nice little acronym. So these are, these are WIMPs. We're a bunch of geeks studying WIMPs. So this is a, uh, uh, pretty good for the whimsy that uh, physicists like. Also trying to produce them at CERN. And, but we look for them striking our detectors and making a little burst of light. And that's why getting rid of the northern lights in our detectors is very important. This shows you the new area and it shows you the set of international experiments that are being set up or are already running in this area. For example, here's, here's the one with the liquid argon in the middle. Uh, it's called DEAP and uh, it's been running for about uh, two and a half years now. It's surrounded, it's very similar to the snow detector, liquid argon in the middle. And argon has properties that <clears throat> if a dark matter particle causes a nucleus to recoil, you get your light out in about 10 nanoseconds. Radioactivity typically makes an electron produce light in the detector. That light comes out in 10 microseconds. And so we can discriminate against that sort of background by a factor of 10 to the ninth just by using the wonderful opportunity to digitize your signals. And we, we do that and then we, we discriminate the short-term bursts from the long-term bursts. And we have a major international collaboration where 
We're running with three tons in Sudbury. We're about to do 20 tons in a lab in Italy with this very major 350 scientists from uh, 13 countries around the world. And then after that, we hope to come back to Snow Lab with 300 tons. And that will push the sensitivity for detecting dark matter down to the point where, ironically for me, the background is now neutrinos that you can't shield out by going underground. Okay, so I threw an awful lot at you in a, in a short uh, period of time. Uh, I usually say that uh, neutrinos uh, interact very seldom, maybe once in your lifetime. They'll stop, one will stop in your body and change one atom into something else, but you won't even notice it unless your eyes happen to be closed and it hits you, as many eyes are by the time I get to this point in my talk. And uh, <laughs> if it hits you right in the eye, you might see a little burst of light. But uh, anyway, so just for some fun, uh, the week that uh, the Nobel Prize was announced. I was on TV it's a lot. It's an illustrious list, including Lester B. Pearson, Alice what, Monroe, and now a guy from Cape Breton. <laughs> Physicist Dr. McDonald is Canada's latest winner of a Nobel Prize. Here to explain why he's the best in the world at what he does is Art McDonald. Hi, I'm Art McDonald. I'm a professor emeritus at Queen's University, originally from Cape Breton, and I attended Dalhousie University. And I'm a co-winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, people from uh, 22 Minutes have asked me to come in and explain what uh, I and our team did to win this prize. We demonstrated that the flavor of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, electron neutrinos, changed into one of the other two flavors, muon and tau neutrinos, as they traveled from the core of the sun to... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm 